Welcome everyone to this second lecture um, about product structure. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we are going to look at some applications of this uh, product structure theorem and we are going to start with uh, two somewhat easy applications to show you a bit uh, what we can do with it. And I'll go in, um, in most of the details, maybe not all all of the details, but I will try to you know, give most of the details for these two applications. And then tomorrow, in the third lecture, I will give you a more like an overview of what else has been done. And uh, yeah, but for today, I really want to focus on two applications. One to the so-called Q number of graphs. That was the first application historically. And the second one uh, to so-called non-repetitive colorings of graphs. Right, so the idea is really to use these two um, as an example of how we apply these uh, product structure theorems. Okay, so let me remind you what, what is the product stru structure theorem. There are two versions of it. Right? The first version is your planar graph is contained into the strong product of H and P, where H has to read at most 8. Second version is contained in the strong product of H, P, and the triangle, where H uh, has to read at most three. And in each case, when you remember, if you remember the proof, H was actually a minor of G. So you actually get that uh, H is a, is a planar graph. Um, okay, so what is the general strategy to solve an open problem on, gra on planar graphs using these tools? Well, you pick a problem that's somehow uh, relatively well understood for bounded tree rate graphs, but which is open for planar graphs. And then you hope that when you use these tools, somehow your understanding for bounded treat graphs lifts or extends in some sense to, to planar graphs, right? So that's the basic strategy. For instance, if what you want to do is bound some graph invariants for planar graphs, then typically you would need that this invariant is bounded for bounded tree with graph. You would need to understand typically quite well the proof there and then hope that uh, it behaves nicely when you take the strong product with a path. That's essentially the strategy. Sometimes it works. Uh, to be fully honest, I, I should mention that I, I try to apply this strategy to many open problems on planar graphs, and most of the cases it failed, <laughs> right? So, but the, in, a, in a few cases, this, uh, this works. Uh, so the, as I mentioned, the first application, and definitely the easiest one, is to uh, the so-called Q numbers of uh, planar graphs. So let me give you quickly the definition of Q numbers. Uh, let me not go into why they are called Q numbers, but um, uh, the, the definition is the following. You have a vertex ordering of uh, your graph. It's called uh, this vertices V1 up to Vn in their ordering. And now we are going to look at rainbows in that ordering. So what is a rainbow? A rainbow is a set of pairwise disjoint edges, or matching, which are nested, like the three uh, edges in orange on this figure. Right? So you have matching of nested edges. That's a rainbow. The size of your rainbow, well, that's the number of edges in it. And the game we are playing here is that we want to find an ordering of your vertices so that you don't have a big rainbow, right? If, if, so if it's the case that you can find an ordering uh, where the largest rainbow has size k, then your Q number is at most k, right? So Q number is a min max. It's the minimum of every ordering of the maximum size of a rainbow in that ordering. Does the definition make sense? Yep, OK. OK, so that's some graph invariant. Uh, there is a whole history around that graph invariant. Let me not go too much into that. But let me mention that there was this conjecture from the early 90s uh, that uh, planar graphs have bounded Q number. Interestingly, one of the authors actually conjectured in another paper that planar graphs have unbounded Q numbers. So whatever the outcome, he, he was right. But uh, somehow people believed it should be, uh, it should be bounded. Um, so, using uh, the, this 
strong. Uh, this uh, product structure, we got uh, a bound. We got a bound of 49. That's essentially the, the best known bound today. Um, and let me now show you that it is bounded, right? I'm not going to show 49 uh, in this lecture. Actually, we are going to revisit this today in the exercise session and improve the bound a bit. So my goal now is just to show you uh, that the, there is a bound. Right. Okay, so to do that, uh, if we remember the, the strategy, well, we need first to see what happens for bounded trivial. And that has been done by previous uh, researchers. It was known for a while that the Q number of a graph is bounded from above by a function of trivial. There was first a big bound, and then Wickert in 2000. Uh, 17 came up with a very nice proof, a very nice argument, giving a 2 to the k minus 1 uh, bound. Right? So there is an exponential bound in k. Uh, it's a very nice proof. I'm not going to do it here, but in case you're intrigued, I encourage you to look it up. It's not too long, and it's uh, very cute. Um, there is this question of, you know, is an exponential bound best possible, or is there a polynomial upper bound? Some people here believe that exponential is the right answer, uh, but uh, there is no, no matching lower bounds so far. Okay, the point for us is that there is a bound as a function of trivial. We are going to use it um, as a black box. Now, what is the key lemma? This is this lemma in red. Uh, the key lemma says that when, when you take the, the strong product of a graph with a path, the Q number behaves really well. Roughly, it increases by at most a factor of three. The new Q number is at most three times the old Q number plus one. We are going to show this lemma uh, on the next slide, uh, but let's see if you accept this lemma Let's see uh, how it gives a bound on the Q number of our planar graph. So we have a planar graph G. It's contained in the product of H and P for some uh, graph H of three, at most eight, and some path P. Now, if you want to bound the Q number of G, it's enough to bound the Q number of the product of H and P. Because if you remember the definition of Q number, you are taking an ordering of the vertices, like the best possible ordering, and you are bounding the, the maximum size of the rainbow. Now, if I'm adding edges to your graph, this only makes your life harder, right? It can only uh, create uh, more rainbows. So in other words, if you have a bound for a graph, you have a bound for all its subgraphs. OK, so it's enough to bound the Q number of the product. And now we use the lemma and this theorem for, for bounded trivial. The lemma says that Q number of H times P is at most three times the Q number of H plus one. The Q number of H, well, it has H as three at most eight. Um, so the Q number of H is at most two to the eight minus one times three plus one. This is 766. And so you get a bound this way. This is not at all an optimized bound, but this is a bound that you get uh, quite quickly. And as I mentioned, we are going to see uh, later in the exercise session how to get 49. And as you might have guessed, we, to do that, we have to use the second version. Right? That's a recurring theme that if you really want to optimize the bounds, you should not use the first version. You should use the second one. The first version is there if you want to have a quick application of product structure. OK, uh, so we need to, to prove this uh, lemma in red. So let's see the proof. OK, the proof will be on the blackboard. <laughs> Didn't put it on the side. That's fine. Let's look, um, let's look at the strong product of H and P. So the, the assumption is that we have H um, which is down here. I always think of H as being horizontally a uh, horizontal graph. And you know, I have some ordering of the vertices of H, which is the optimal ordering for the Q number of H. 
right? So now I'm thinking of the vertices of H as being ordered optimally for the Q number of H. Right? So horizontally, I have H like this. Vertically, I have my P here. Right? And now in the product, where I have a copy of H in each row, etc., then I have the edges in between my so what is the, or the ordering that we are going to use? Well, there are two obvious orderings to try. Maybe the most obvious one is start with the top row, use the optimal ordering for H, and then continue with the next row following this ordering. So more precisely, in your ordering of, of the whole vertex set here, you are here, then you continue here, and you continue Right? This is probably the most obvious ordering to try, and this is why it's a very easy lemma because this obvious ordering works. It gives you this, uh, this bound. So we are going to check it in a moment, but is the ordering clear for everyone? Yes? Okay. Okay, so we just order row by row, starting say by the top row, and in each row we use the optimal ordering for each. Okay, so let's check that it works. Now, what do we want to do? We want to bound, in this ordering, the maximum size of a rainbow, right? So if H has Q number K, we want to show that the maximum size of a rainbow in my ordering of the product is at most 3K plus one. And so let's uh, call K the Q number of H. So we are aiming for a bound of 3k plus 1. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a big rainbow in this ordering and you know I'm going to, to bound the size of the rainbow by relating the, this big rainbow to rainbows in H. So imagine that you have some big rainbow in your ordering of the product. Think of a big rainbow. Now, let's look at the edges of the product. The edges of the product, they connect two vertices which are either on the same row or on two consecutive rows. Right? So in particular, given the ordering I took, which is by rows, if I look at the, the largest edge in my rainbow, the one with the biggest span, well, I have two options for that edge. Either the two endpoints are in the same row or they span two consecutive rows. Right? As you might have guessed, the first option is quite easy to deal with. And so let's deal with that case first. Imagine that in my rainbow here, if I look at the, the edge with the largest span, the two endpoints are in the same row. But then it means that all these edges, they have the endpoints in that row, given the ordering that we used. But then it means that this is a rainbow in H, and so it has size at most k. But it's not a very interesting example. So, okay. So if you if you agree with that, let's assume that this edge with the largest span it actually spans two consecutive rows. This would be the interesting case. Okay. So now let's draw two consecutive rows. But I'm not going to draw two consecutive rows like in the product. I'm going to look at those two consecutive rows in terms of their ordering. So I have two consecutive rows. Uh, maybe let's do it here. So there will be some row i, and then I have some row i plus one. And in both cases, they are ordered according to the ordering of H, right? And this is how they appear in my ordering of the product. Okay, now I'm going to assume that the, ah, it's here. I'm going to assume that this biggest edge is actually spanning the two rows. All right, 
No, I will have to, you know, um, classify a bit the types of my edges in my rainbow, and we will see that the, the bound we are aiming for will come from this classification. First, well, I assume that my biggest edge spans two consecutive rows, and this could go on for a while. If I look at my rainbow, but it could be that at some point, when I go down through the nesting order in my rainbow, at some point, I might actually, you know, stick only to one of the two uh, rows. It doesn't matter which one, left or right, let, let's pick left, but this is not important. Right, so I'm spanning the two rows for a while, and then at some point, I end up in just one row. So for this last section here, where I'm only in one row, again, that part of the rainbow is small. It has size at most k because this is a rainbow in edge. <coughs> right, so let's, run. let's observe that right away. So this part of the rainbow, which is fully inside one row, we know that it has size at most k. So let's remove it from the picture. We remember that, you know, there might be k edges of our rainbow that are completely inside one uh, row. We remove them, and now we are going to care about the part of the rainbow which sits in between two consecutive rows. And our goal would be to show a bound of 2k plus 1, right? Because if we show a bound of 2k plus 1 plus these uh, k potential edges there, we get a bound of 3k plus 1, which is what we are aiming for. Okay? So this is the new setup. The new setup is that we have a rainbow, but it actually, it's a rainbow between two consecutive rows. Okay, so let me delete these edges here. All right. So we are, you know, cleaning up a little bit the picture. I have a rainbow. All the edges are between two consecutive rows. And now I will, uh, this, I will classify the edges into three types. One type will give me at most one edge. Another type will give me at most k edges. And the third type will give me at most k edges. So together we will have at most two k plus one edges, plus the k that we just forgot about. That's the three uh, k plus one. Okay, so what are the three types? The first type is an edge that connects some vertex v here to its copy in the next row. Right? So I mean, each row is a copy of h. So when I look at a vertex v in row i, it has a corresponding copy in. Uh, in the next row, right? So if I have an edge that connects a vertex to its corresponding copy in the next row, I'm going to label that edge with an equality sign. Okay? And before we go to the next two labels, let's actually convince ourselves that you have at most one such edge. Right? So if you have an edge connecting V to its copy V prime, now imagine that you have a second one connecting W to its copy. Well, if W is to the right of V, then W prime is to the right of V prime because you're using the same ordering each time. But then in that case, the edge connecting W to W prime would cross the edge connecting V to V prime. So it's not a rainbow. They are not in a nesting order. Right? So if W was to the left, it's the same problem because W prime would be to the left of V prime. So they would cross. Right? Okay, so you don't have that. So the, the edges with an inequality sign, there is only at most one. And that's the plus one in the bound. And let's forget about them. Now we only have edges crossing the two consecutive rows. And each edge goes from some vertex to another vertex in the next row, which is not the copy of that vertex. OK, 
okay, now we have two cases to consider. When you look at an edge going from V to uh, W prime here, well, you look at the corresponding image of V and W prime, and you ask in H, and you ask is V to the left of W or to the right of the value in H. So these are two possibilities, and this is how we label these edges that are remaining. Right, so I have an edge connecting V to some vertex W prime in the next row. These two vertices, they correspond to vertices of H, and in my optimal ordering of H, either V is to the left of W or V is to the right of the value. Right, so if V is to the left of W, I'm going to draw uh, a smaller than a label, and otherwise I'm going to draw a bigger than. Does that make sense, the definition? Yeah? Okay, so we have two labels for the remaining edges. Let's maybe start uh, with the smaller, smaller than uh, label. So say that you have a big rainbow of this form. So what's happening? So you have to say V goes to the value prime here, and I don't know, X goes to Y prime. Now, you look in H, because V is left of W, in H, you have an edge like that. Now let's look at X to Y prime. When you look at the corresponding images in H, X is to the left of Y. Okay, but X is to the right of V, Y is to the left of W, because we keep all using the same orderings each time, right? So it means that X is to the right of V, Y is to the left of W, and X is to the left of uh, Y. Right? So you see that when I consider the first two edges in my uh, rainbow that are labeled uh, smaller than, I get the corresponding uh, nested edges in H. And now, obviously, you, will see, you see that this will go on, right? So these smaller than edges, they map to a rainbow in H. So you have at most them. Is that convincing? Okay, so now the situation will be symmetric uh, when it's bigger than, so let's do it uh, quickly. Except the nesting order will be uh, reversed. So now say that we have um, bigger than. Again, I'm looking at H here. Okay, V is bigger than W prime. It means that in H, V is uh, to the right of W. So they appear like that in H. Now, X is bigger than Y prime. So X is to the right of Y in, uh, in H. But what do we know about X? X is to the right of V, so X is here, and Y is to the left of W, so Y is here. Now we have this. Right, so now we have these two edges that nest from big to small. This maps to small to big, but it maps to uh, two nested edges. So the nesting order gets, gets reversed, but it's still a nesting. And this, of course, extends. So uh, these edges that are labeled bigger than, they also map to uh, a rainbow in, in H, and hence you have at most K of them. Right, so all together we have the, the desired bound, at most 2K plus 1 for the edges that go across, plus at most K for the edges that stay within the, the row, and that's 3K plus 1. Um, so hopefully you're convinced by this lemma. And Q number is a really nice parameter because it's essentially, essentially almost one of the only parameters which behaves 
uh, nicely with respect to taking the a strong product with a path without first modifying a little bit the problem. Um, so in, in most other applications, in order to have the equivalent of this lemma, we need first to tweak a little bit the, the parameters we play with. And we are going to see an example of that in, in the next slide. But for Q number, you just take the parameter itself and it behaves really nicely with taking the, the product with the bar. Other questions about this? Yes. Uh, is it math possible? The three equals one? Hmm. Actually, I don't know. I definitely don't know how to improve it. But I'm, yeah, I'm afraid to say something wrong, so let, let me leave it at I don't know. <laughs> so That's a good uh, question. Yeah, the improvement is on the bound of true with that. Yes, OK. So that, if that's the motivation of your question, is the improvement does not come from improving this lemma, but it comes from using the, the, um, the, the second version of the theorem here. Yeah. And in here, you also have to deal with taking the product with the triangle. As you are going to see in the exercise session, this is actually not difficult to understand. Um, yes. But the improvement comes from using this version, but not from improving the, the bound of the lemma. Um, I, I, I think it's definitely not known that there is a better bound. I don't know if it's known to be that. There was another question there. Yeah, it is similar to his. So I was worried that there can be too many crossings so, uh, between layers. So uh, and, and this is a planar graph. So I was also worried that this can be improved or not. OK, so if I rephrase your question, I think it is, OK, now you want to bound the Q number of planar graphs, but what you're doing is that you're bounding the Q number of this product. But if you look at the product, the, there is lots of crossings in there. Yeah. Can, can you do better by using the fact that you know, some of these crossings don't exist? That's a very relevant question. We have no idea how to uh, uh, really uh, uh, improve the bound using the non-existence of crossings. I, I think we can win one. Is that correct, Piotr? Yeah. Yes, but that's not correct, is it? That's not correct. I don't know. I don't actually. I don't remember the story. I, I don't know. Maybe it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, there is a work, but this work essentially boils down to like understanding what what are, what are the possibilities in the planar setup and getting rid of the sum. Uh, some, some of the cases. Some yes. of the cases. Yes. So it's, it's very technical, yeah, but it's, uh, it's what it is. Okay, so it's a very good question, of course, and that might be the way to, to improve the bounds. OK, are there other questions about yeah, uh, Q number? Uh, yes. I, I'm sorry, but I just missed the argument why we care about only consecutive rows. OK, so why do we care about uh, edges of our rainbow that goes uh, between two consecutive rows? It's because when you look at your rainbow, some of the edges will go between two consecutive rows. And then, when you go down the nesting order, at some point, you will have only edges that go within one row. And that row is fixed. And then, that's a rainbow in, in H. And you know that. Why it's row I plus 1 and not I plus 10? It's a product of the path. So, the only edges. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, that doesn't solve your question? Okay, thanks. Uh, also? Yes. Um, so the lemma on the top, the B short or the theorem about mm -hmm. the three widths, mm -hmm. actually you really need it for three widths three, right? Yes, the and end. there is a better one there. There, there is a better one. Okay, so that's how you get 14. Okay, so yeah. but I mean, this we are anticipating the exercise okay. session, but you know, this is uh -huh. yeah, yeah. since you are eager to, to know. Um, okay, so what do we have here? We have a graph of 3 with 3 in the second version. <coughs> but actually, okay, I should have written it here, but you might assume that it is planar. It's a planar graph of 3 with 3, and that makes sense. That makes a difference because, you know, there are there are graphs of 3 3 which are not planar. Having planarity uh, forces the graph to be 
a subgraph of uh, a stacked triangulation. And the Q number of stacked triangulation has been the topic of studies. And in 2020, uh, an improved bound was found, and uh, the bound is 5. So there is an upper bound of 5 for planar graphs of trivial 3. And we don't know if that's tight, but there are examples achieving 4. Okay, so that's like a big ingredient of getting a better bound is using that there is a bound of 5 in, in this case. And for all we know, it, it could maybe even be improved to 4. And as far as I'm aware, this lower bound of 4 in that special case is actually the, the best known lower bound in general for the Q number. I don't think planar graphs with a bigger Q number than 4 are known. 4. So, yeah, so that was the status of this conjecture that, you know, it's conjecture to be bounded and we don't know examples with bigger than 4. Okay. Last question, question about the yes? Is the example trivial? Like with Q number four? No, it's not trivial. Okay. Yes, Shimon. Is there a list of forbidden subgraphs for graph for graphs about it? Q number? Like uh oh. You mean a finite list? Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> sorry, sorry about it. Yeah, maybe that's all topic. Okay, I'll think about it, but um, I bet no. There was another question, I don't remember where. Okay, apparently no. Okay, if there are no other questions, I suggest we, we go on to the next um, applications I wanted to tell you about, uh, non-repetitive colorings. Okay, so I will tell you the definition, and then this is an application I will spend a bit more time on, and I will tell you why I want to spend more time on. Well, one reason is that I want to, you know, develop an application in detail with you, not just uh, give you a high level overview. Uh, but there is a second reason. Um, okay, so what is the definition? We are coloring vertices of a graph. Um, and we want our coloring to be non-repetitive. What does this mean? It means that whenever you look at a path with an even number of vertices, say 2k vertices, and you look at the color sequence on the first half, it should not be the same as the color sequence on the second half. So it should not be like on this picture. Right? This is a repetition of length 2k. The length in this setting is the number of vertices, because we are counting like uh, the number of symbols that we see uh, in our color sequence, right? So we would like a vertex coloring of the graph so that when you look at uh, any path with an even number of vertices, you never see a uh, repetition there. Okay, so this is uh, some uh, exotic looking type of uh, coloring. Uh, it takes its origins in the, the domain of combinatorics on walls. Um, so there, typically, they would not uh, talk about like non-repetitive worlds, but they typically call that square-free worlds, a square being a repetition. Um, and th this is really how combinat combinatrix on worlds started, actually, in, uh, more than uh, 100 years ago. Uh, that was with the proof that there are arbitrarily long uh, worlds that are square-free on an alphabet of size 3. So in our, uh, in our terminology, it's that any path can be uh, non-repetitively non colored with three colors. OK, so in the graph setting, um, people started to look at non-repetitive coloring uh, with this paper. Uh, and in that paper, they conjectured that planar graphs have bounded non-repetitive chromatic numbers. But so there is a constant that works for, for planar graphs. And um, yeah, I should also mention that Yai Gaichuk, who is from here, uh, is like one of the big, uh, how to say, uh, people there behind uh, the, the push to study this uh, topic. 
Um, so it's definitely a, a favorite topic uh, of his. So he did a lot of, say, propaganda around this, uh, <laughs> these open problems. Um, <clears throat> OK, so it turns out that using product structure, you get a bound. Uh, the best known bound right now is 768. And now let's look at uh, how to get such a bound. <coughs> so now if you remember the strategy, step number one is check what happens for bounded tree width. Step number two is, you know, check what happens when you take strong product with a path and hope that everything goes through. So for bounded tree width, the situation looks good because already in 2008 there was a bound of 4 to the k if you have to read k um, on the non-repetitive chromatic number. Again, it's unknown if that's best possible. We don't know if there is a polynomial upper bound. The worst examples that are known, they have a non-repetitive chromatic number about k squared. So there is a big gap there, but still there is a bound. And then, you know, you, you might now jump right into studying the product with a path and hope that it goes through. So that's what we tried at first, and we, we have no idea how to do it. So in other words, we don't know how to, to bound the non-repetitive chromatic number of h times p as a function of the non-repetitive chromatic number of h. So that was a stumbling block. But then it turns out that with a small tweak, everything goes through. And this is a recurring theme in some of the applications, that sometimes, if you want to apply product structure, you first need you know, to modify a little bit the graph invariant you care about, so that it becomes nice when you take the strong product with a path. So you want it to, be, to, become, you want it to become nice, but still you want it to be relevant for the problem you're studying. And that's exactly uh, what we are going to do now. And this will motivate the following definitions that might look uh, a bit technical at first sight. So the motivation for these definitions is to have like a robust version of non-repetitive colorings, uh, which will behave nicely when you take strong product with a path. That's really the, the reason for this. OK, so you all know about the notion of walks in graphs. Right, so walks are paths where you can repeat vertices. You know, start on some vertex, and then you slide along edges, and you don't care if you repeat vertices. That's a walk, a sequence of uh, vertices which are um, connected by edges, every two consecutive vertices. Now there is a notion of lazy walk. What is a lazy walk? Well, it's a walk on the graph if you pretend that you have self loops, like loops on every vertex. So in other words, in your, in your walk, well, you know, when you're on a vertex, you can either go to a neighboring vertex, or you can decide to stay on the same vertex. And you can do that as many times as you want. Right? So when you do a lazy walk on a graph, you can, if you're on some vertex V, you can repeat V several times. It's like you're taking the loop on V, and then you, you continue with your walk. And so that's the notion of lazy walks. All the slides after will be about handling lazy walks. So is the definition clear? Yeah? OK. Um, <clears throat> and let me uh, repeat one last time that the, 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 the goal, I mean, the reason for, introduce, the, for looking at lazy walks is because this will be relevant when we take the, the product with the path. OK, now we have a stronger notion of non-repetitive coloring. I will say that the coloring is strongly non-repetitive if the following happens. Whenever you have a repetitively colored lazy walk. So what does it mean to have a repetitively colored lazy walk? So you have a lazy walk. Your lazy walk is a sequence of vertices. Now in your coloring, you look at the corresponding color sequence. And now you have such a color sequence of even length. And it's repetitively colored if the first half is the same as the second half. Now the condition is that whenever you have a repetitively colored lazy walk, there is a vertex in the first half, some vi in the first half, which gets repeated in the corresponding position in the second half. And this is a crucial definition, so let me emphasize it with a drawing. 
right? So you have your sequence of vertices in your lazy row. And the, the condition that you want, if it's repetitively colored, you want that there is some vi here, which is the same as the corresponding uh, vertex in the second half, right? So you want that there exists i such that vi is equal to vk plus i. Right, so we are not forbidding the uh, repetitions on lazy books. That would be way, way too strong. And one reason is that, you know, you have like a lazy walks where you start on a, on a vertex, you do some business, you go back, to, and then you go back to your original vertex and you, you do the same business again. Right? You do twice the same thing. Then whatever coloring you put on your graph, this would be a repetitively colored lazy book, right? Okay, so you cannot avoid having repetitively colored lazy balls, but what we want to avoid, what we want to achieve here is that if you have a repetitively colored lazy walk, then there, there is a step uh, i in the first part where the vertex there the, is not the same as the corresponding vertex in the second half. Does the definition make sense? Okay, so it's a technical definition, but it's exactly the one we need uh, for our purpose. Okay, now let's call uh, uh, coloring strongly non-repetitive if this property is satisfied. So on every repetitively colored lazy walk, you have some vi which is equal to vi plus k. And why is it a stronger property? Well, a strongly non-repetitive coloring is definitely non-repetitive. Why is that? Well. Assume that you have a path which is repetitively colored. That path is a lazy walk. Right? But then, by this condition, there is a vertex in the first half of your path which is the same as the corresponding vertex in the second half. So, so your path is not a path because you're re you repeated the vertex. Right? So, so this implies in particular that such a coloring is non-repetitive on all the paths. But it's a stronger notion. Okay. And now it turns out that the, the, if you look at strong, strongly non-repetitive colorings, it turns out that the bound for, for 3 with K, uh, it, it implies for this stronger version as well. And it's essentially the same proof, essentially the same strategy. You, I mean, you have to tweak it in the obvious ways. So you get a uh, four, to to, 4 to the K bound, even for this stronger notion. And I, in my opinion, actually, the, the proof is I mean, it's more natural in, in this setup, actually. But um, um, you have exactly the, the same bound there. So we are good in this sense, that this, this modified invariant, it, uh, it's still bounded for, for bounded tree width. And now it will uh, work nicely when you take the strong product with a path. And that's the, that was the point of this modification. Right, so let me call chi strong the minimum number of colors in a strongly non-repetitive coloring of the graph. And for this modified version, you can show that if you have a graph H and a path P, then your invariant grows by at most a factor of four when you take the product with a path. Okay, so there are no questions. I suggest we try and see how to prove it, but maybe before we do that, let's see why this implies that uh, we have a bound for all planar graphs. Now we combine everything, assuming this lemma and the previous theorem, and that this gives you a bound. So if, you, if your graph is planar, it's contained into the product of H and P, H has 3 with 8, as usual. If you want to bound your coloring invariant on G, it's enough to bound it on the product. Right? Because if you have a, a good coloring, so strongly non-repetitive coloring for a graph, you have, you have it for all its subgraphs. Because when we remove edges and vertices, you are only killing some lazy walks. Okay? So it's enough to color the product, 
Now if you apply this lemma in red, you get four times the bond you get for H, and the bond you get for H is four to the eight. So you get four times four to the eight, that's four to the nine, and this is this big number here, 262,144. Uh, Okay, so this is uh, assuming the lemma in red and the, the bound for bounded fluid. This is a quick way of uh, getting a bound for pentagraph. Of course, as you might expect, the better bound of 768 comes from using the second version of the product structure and uh, using better bounds. This will be done at the exercise session. Okay? But here we see that uh, it is bound. So it, it all boils down to two things. One, proving the lemma in red, and two, believing this bound for, for bond theory. So I suggest with the time that is left, to start first with proving this lemma in red. Because this is where, really where we use the product, where we take the product with the path. And if I have enough time, I will uh, then give you the proof for bond theory. And, and if not, well, I, I won't give it to <laughs> it, it will depend on how long this will take. Okay, so we want to prove this lemma, this strong version of non-repetitive coloring uh, incurs a factor of four at most when you take the product with the path P. That's what we want to prove. And to prove it, I'm going to you know, introduce yet another technical definition and yet another lemma, lemma B. And we are going to see that lemma B actually implies lemma A. So once we are convinced that lemma B implies lemma A, then we are going to show to prove lemma B. Okay, so what is this uh, uh, yet stronger version of uh, non-repetitive coverings? I call it super strongly non-repetitive. Um, so this is like the, the strongest notion you, can, you could imagine in this uh, direction. So say that the coloring is super strongly non-repetitive if whenever you have a repetitively colored lazy walk, so if it's repetitively colored you know that the color sequence on the first half and on the second half are the same. But now you are going to ask that if the color sequences are the same then actually the vertex sequences are the same. Right? So for every eye for every position i in the first part, vi is the same vertex as vi plus k. Right? So you ask your work to be boring, in a sense. That if it's repetitively colored, then the what you did in the first half is exactly what you did in the second half in terms of vertex sequences. Right? So let me emphasize the difference with strongly non-repetitive. Strongly non-repetitive means that if you're repetitively colored, then there is some vi in the first half that gets repeated as a vertex in the corresponding position in the second half. So there is a vertex that is repeated in the corresponding position. And for the super strong version, you ask that all vertices in the first half, they get repeated in the, in the second half at their respective positions. Right? So it's, it's really the difference between an existential and a universal quantifier. Right? Is the definition clear? Okay, so we have this super strong, of course, if you, are, if you have a super strongly non-repetitive coloring, it's strongly non-repetitive. Uh, and what we are going to show that later, next slide, is that uh, if you have a path, then you have this super strong type of colorings with at most four colors. And so why is this good? I, I claim that if we have this bound of four, then we get uh, lemma A. And the 4 here, of course, is the, the factor of 4. There. Okay, so let's see how we get that. So you have your product. Right. You have H here, P there, then 
have my rows of my product, uh, just in between rows, as usual. Now I I am going to to define a product coloring. So I have some, you know, I have some strongly non-repetitive coloring of H with some number of colors, say with K colors. And then I have this super strong coloring for the path. Now for every vertex in the product, this vertex is a pair of vertices of a vertex in H and a vertex in P. And the way I'm color going to color the vertex in the product is by taking the product of their colors, the concatenation of their colors, that should be precise. Right, so the coloring of your vertex V will be the concatenation of the color in H and the color in P. Here using a strong coloring and here using a super strong coloring. Right? So if you have V, which is X and Y, with X in H and Y in P, the coloring of V will be the color the concatenation of uh, these two colorings, which I call phi 1 and phi 2, right? So phi 1 would be a strongly non-repetitive coloring of H, and phi 2 will be a super strong coloring of your path. So is the definition of the coloring clear? Yeah? Okay, so I, I claim that this is a, this is a, a, a coloring that works. So in terms of the number of colors, we are good, right? Because if the coloring of H uses K colors and the coloring of P uses four colors, we are using at most four K colors, and that's exactly what we want to achieve. So in terms of number of colors, this is fine. Now we only need to check that the resulting coloring is strongly non-repetitive, right? We are trying to bound the, 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 the strong version of our invariant. So why is it the case? Well, assume that you have a repetitively colored walk. So picture in your head a repetitively colored walk in the product. Okay. I'm not going to draw it, but you know, imagine some repetitively colored walk, W, um, and when I say uh, repetitively colored walk, I should emphasize the word lazy. It's really a lazy. But, uh, you have a repetitively colored lazy walk in the product according to this coloring. What we want to show is that there is a vertex in the first half of your walk which gets repeated at the corresponding position in the second half. Right? This is what we want to show. If this is true for every uh, repetitively colored lazy walk, then your coloring is strongly non-repetitive. Okay, so we have this uh, walk which is lazy and repetitively colored. And when you have a walk in the product, this maps two walks in each of the two uh, graphs that you used for defining your product. That's why uh, uh, it, it maps to lazy walks. Why? Well, when you move, well, when you stay on the vertex in your lazy walk in the product, you obviously stay on the corresponding vertices in H and P. And now if you move along an edge here, well, it depends. Either it maps to an edge in H, or it maps to a vertex. And in, if in that case, you just stay on that vertex. And same in P. When you move along an edge, if it's on the same level, then you stay on the corresponding vertex of P. If you go between levels, then you would uh, go along an edge in P. Right? So each move you do in your lazy walk maps to a valid move in H and P. Right? So this lazy walk maps to a lazy walk in H. This lazy walk maps to a lazy walk in P. When you look at the mapping of your lazy walk in H, there is a corresponding color sequence associated to it. Just look at the first coordinate of your coloring, the coloring in H. What you know is that this lazy walk in the product, it was repetitively colored, right? So the color sequence on the first half was the same as the color sequence on the second half. 
But now if you only look at the first coordinate, this is still true, right? <laughs> you still have that the color sequence of the first half is the same as the second one. Right, so if you drop the second coordinate and only focus on the first one, you have in H a repetitively colored lazy walk uh, according to the coloring that you use of H. Okay? Now you know that your coloring of H was strongly non-repetitive. Right? So in the image of your walk in H, there is some vertex VI which gets repeated at the corresponding position there. Right? So in other words, and let me write this down. So you have your, walk, your repetitively colored lazy walk in, uh, in the product. This is some sequence of vertices. And what we just discussed is that there is some i such that bi and bi plus k Oh, maybe write the k plus i uh, map to the same vertex of h. Again, what is that? We took our, our lazy walk in the product, it's repetitively colored, we mapped that lazy walk to h, we got a lazy walk, we only looked at the first coordinate of our coloring that was still repetitively colored, but the coloring was strongly non-repetitive. So in the lazy walk that we got on H, we know that there is a vertex in some position I in the first part, which gets repeated, a vertex of H. So now we go back to our product. This means that there is some VI here, so that when you look at the corresponding vertex of the second part, both of these vertices, they map to the same vertex of H. We don't have yet the fact that they map to the same vertex of the product, but they, that they are the same vertex, vertices, but at least they map to the same vertex of H. You agree with that? Okay, so we have that. And now we are going to use the second dimension. We are going to look at what happens when we map our walk to P. Right, so we have our lazy walk, it maps to a lazy walk in P. Okay. It, when you look at the second coordinate of our product coloring, this is a repetitively colored lazy walk in P. Right? But the coloring of P that we use is this super strong coloring. And because our lazy walk on P is, uh, uh, is repetitively colored, we know that for the mapping of this lazy walk on P, the first half of our vertex sequence is the same as the second half of our vertex sequence. So when we do the mapping on P, we know that the image of VI on P and VK plus I on P are the same. Because this is true for all the VJs. Right? For every j, which is a position between 1 and k, vj and vk plus j, they map to the same vertex of p because our coloring of p is super strong. Okay, and now we use this with j equal to i, and it, it means in particular that vi and vk plus i, they map to the same vertex on p, they map to the same vertex in h, so they are the same vertices. So we, do, we did get uh, the property that we wanted, namely that if we have a repetitively colored lazy walk, 
in, uh, in this coloring of the product, then there is a vertex in the first half of our work which gets repeated in the corresponding position. Are you happy with that proof? Yes? Okay. So this shows that, you know, assuming the existence of these uh, magic colorings of the path, uh, these super strong colorings of the path, then we do get the, the lemma that we care about um, for, the, for taking the product with the path P. Okay, so now we are down to you know, proving that you have such colorings. And uh, as I said, I, would, you know, I want to do this proof uh, completely with you. Um, so we want to prove lemma B. To prove lemma B, we are going to use lemma C. And we are going to see that you know, lemma C implies lemma B. Okay, and then we will have to prove uh, lemma C. I, I promise you this, there won't be a lemma D. Right? So, so uh, when we will really prove lemma C from scratch, uh, there, won't, there won't be any indirection. Okay, so we have some understanding of what lemma B says, right? We, we have a path, we want to show that there is this super strongly non-repetitive coloring with four colors of your path. And the way it has been done, and that was done before in the literature, this is something that was known for a while, the existence of these colorings for the path. Um, the way it was done is by showing that, uh, and this comes from combinatorial on boards, I'm just rephrasing it here, by showing that paths have vertex colorings with four colors, such that the coloring is non-repetitive in the usual sense, so just for paths, uh, and palindrome free. So you have these two properties. There is a vertex coloring of your path, which is non-repetitive, but you have an extra property. There are no palindromes in your color sequence. So what do I mean by no palindromes? It's exactly what you expect. So palindrome in a color sequence, this is a, a sequence of an odd number of symbols that form a pal palindrome, like this one, or... So you have an odd number of symbols, you have a middle, and then when from the middle you go, you read your sequence from the middle to the left, or from your middle to the right, you get the same sequence. Right? That's a palindrome. And you want to avoid that. As, as factors? Yeah, as a consecutive, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so yes, by the way, so lemma C says that you can do this with four colors, and well, definitely you need four colors, you know, just to get some more intuition, let's see why you need four colors. Well, let's pretend you can do it with three colors. Let, let me do it with uh, colors A, B, C. Then, you know, I start with color A, I want my coloring to be non-repetitive. I'm coloring the path here, so you know, imagine I'm building a world, coloring a path. So the next vertex, well, it cannot be called A, so I need to color it B. Then the next vertex cannot be called B, that would be a repetition, but it cannot be called A either, because that would be a palindrome. It has to be called C. Okay, so far I'm good. Now the next one, when you see the pattern, I have to use always a symbol, a color, which is distinct from the last two. So I'm forced to use A. So if I only have three colors, everything is forced. And this will lead to a problem. Uh, here I have to use B, and here I have to use C, and now I have a repetition. Right, so if you give me only three colors, there is no way I can avoid repetitions and palindromes. But it turns out that with four, you can. Okay. So why is this lemma good for proving lemma B? Let's, uh, let's see that quickly. So obviously what we are going to show is that we take such a coloring and we are going to show that it's a super strongly non-repetitive coloring. Right, so you take your path, take a, a coloring which is non-repetitive and palindrome free with four colors and we want to uh, check that it's, uh, it has this property of being super strongly non-repetitive. 
Okay, so I have my path. And I take this coloring. And now what, what should I do? I should look at the repetitively colored lazy walk. And I want to show that it's boring in the sense that the first half of the vertex sequence is the same as the second half of the vertex sequence. So let W be a repetitively colored lazy walk. In this coloring I get from Lemassi which is non-repetitive and palindrome free. I have this repetitively colored lazy walk. Say, as usual, it's V1 up to V2K. And what I want to show is that V1 is the same vertex as VK plus 1, V2 is the same vertex as VK plus 2, etc. Right? I want to show this property. Okay, let's see what happens if I, we somehow knew that V1 is equal to Vk plus 1. Oh yes, maybe to optimize a bit the proof. Oh no, let's not optimize. Yeah, let's optimize. So we are going to take W to be a shortest such walk which is problematic in the sense that it doesn't satisfy our condition. Right, so I'm doing a proof by contradiction. Right, so why does this mean that it's problematic? It means that it's not true that it's boring. So it's not true that the uh, first half of the vertex sequence is equal to the, the second half. Right, so I'm assuming, proof by contradiction, that I have a problematic walk, a problematic lazy walk, and I take a shortest one. Okay, that's my W. And the fact that it's shortest will simplify a bit my life. Uh, for instance, could it be the case that I'm repeating a vertex in my vertex sequence, like that I'm staying on a vertex? So let's see what it means. So if in your lazy walk, say in the first half, you have some vertex V, and you decide, you know, to stay on on V at the next step by using a loop. Then in the color sequence, if that vertex V is colored red, it means that you see red red in your color sequence. So in the corresponding part, uh, in the corresponding vertex in the second half, you have to see red red again. But your coloring is non-repetitive, so it's definitely a proper coloring. So it means that in the second part, when you see red red, you're also staying on the corresponding vertex. Right? Because it's neighbors that are colored differently. So if you stay on a vertex, when you do a move, if you stay on the same vertex in the first half, you stay on the corresponding vertex in the second half and vice versa. Right? But now if you just decide not to stay on the vertex and move right away somewhere else, you get a shorter uh, problematic walk, right? So you might assume that you are not using the loops at all. So yes, there is a question. Mm, uh, you may hypothetically stay like, in the last occurrence in the first half and the first in the second half. Yes, I, I was expecting that. Uh, that's a very good point, Wojtek. So to be in line with this, uh, this argument that I was trying to convince you of, what I'm going to assume here is that when I look at the first half, and I look at two consecutive verte vertices in my vertex sequence, they are never the same. In the first half. I'm not going to argue anything about the last vertex of the first sequence, of the first part, and the first vertex of the second part. Thanks for this uh, 
Very good remark, Wojtek. Okay, so again, you look at the first half, you look at your vertex sequence, whenever you see a vertex and you look at the next one, it will be a distinct vertex. You're not using a loop. Uh, the next one in the first half. Okay, so that's one thing we know. Um, now let's uh, clean up a bit more the problem. Imagine case one. Imagine that somehow V1 is the same as Vk plus 1. Right, so the first half and the second half, they start on the same vertex. We know that the work is problematic. It's not the same vertex sequence both times. But imagine that we know that somehow they start on the same vertex, these two parts. We are going to see that in that case, it must be boring, actually, that the vertex sequence gets repeated. So this first case, it won't, it won't happen if the, the work is problematic. So why is that? Well, you know, let's look at V1. V1 is somewhere on the path. And V2, as I try to argue, it's not V1. You, you, you moved left or right on the path. You didn't stay. So, you know, V2 maybe without loss of generality, say it's on the right. What happens for the corresponding vertices in the second half? Well, Vk plus 1 is here, because we assume that V1 and Vk plus 1 are the same vertices. What about Vk plus 2? I claim that Vk plus 2 must be Vt. Why is that? Well, if this is called A and this is called B, in your color sequence, at the beginning, you see A and B. So in the second half, you should see A and B. But if you go here to the left, what we know is that we have some color C here, which is not B. Why we know that C is not B? Because otherwise, it would be a palindrome. Right? So the fact that there are no palindromes in our coloring implies that if you see AB and that you are here, well, you must uh, go to the right as well. And not everything is synchronized. Right? So VK plus 2 is here, etc., etc. It's a boring walk, so it's not problematic. You agree with that? OK, so let's look at the second case then. OK, V1 is not Vk plus 1. And now we are, getting, we are going to get a contradiction. Either we are going to find a repetition, like a path which is repetitively colored, and that will contradict the fact that the coloring is non-repetitive, or we are going to, to get a palindrome. This will be a contradiction as well. OK, so V1 is not Vk plus 1, so it means that Vk plus 1 is either to the left or to the right. Say, without loss of generality, it's to the right. but the two vertices are not the same. And now I really have only two cases to consider. I know that V1 and Vk plus 1, they are color the same, right? because the color sequences, they get repeated. Now, when I go from V1 to V2, I, I don't know if I go right or left. Let's just draw an example where I go right, but this is not really important. If I go right, And I see V2. Here, well, I don't know if I go right or left. There are two cases again. And we, we need to, to check these two cases. OK, so let's imagine that here you go right. And let's imagine that here you go right, for instance. This is one possibility. The argument will be the same, essentially, in, mo in all cases. So we just consider one case right now. So here we go to Vk plus 2. So in these cases, in, in this situation, the moves will be synchronized. Whenever you go right here, you go right here. Whenever you go left here, you go left 
there as well because there are no palindromes, right? So the first move, the fact that you decided to synchronize on the first move will make everything synchronized by the, the reason we discussed before. You, you, you are happy with that? No? You, can you okay, elaborate? let me elaborate. Okay, let's look at what happens on the third step. Here, when I go from V1 to V2, I see colors, say, A and B. Now I, I go to V3. Okay. V3, it could be the previous one, it, it could be this vertex, or it could be another vertex. Let's go here to make it a bit more interesting. I see some color C here. So if I see a color C here, then this color is distinct from these two. Why? Well, it cannot be B because it would be a repetition, and it cannot be A because that would be a palindrome. So if I'm going to right, I see C, which is distinct from A and B. So if I'm here, I know that I cannot go on A, I must go right, and I must see C here. Yes, and if you go And if I decide to go left, then in my color sequence, I have A, B, A, and then I know here that I should do A, B, and I must go back to A because here this is colored differently. Right? So the point is that when you synchronize on the first move, if you decide to do the same thing for the first moves, then everything is synchronized. And I'm just, you know, looking at that case where everything is synchronized in the same way, it could happen that you actually mirror everything that you synchronize in the other way. But let's, you know, start with this case. Uh, so you synchronize in this way, and well, here, when you go right, you go right, when you go left, you go left. But you know, eventually you have to arrive uh, at, uh, in, in my work, I have to arrive to this vertex, eventually. So I go right, left, right, left, right, but at some point in my work, I will need to hit this vertex. Maybe I will hit it many times, but I, I will need to hit it. And now, if you look at the first half of my vertex sequence, if I decide to go left at some point, I know that I will eventually go back to the vertex I went left from, and this will define the closed work. Right? But then in the second half, this will define a closed work as well, with exactly the same pattern of moves and exactly the same color sequence. Okay? But then I, I could just remove this closed work from my from my lazy work. I would still get a lazy work, and I would get a shorter color sequence. I would get a shorter lazy work, which is repetitively colored, and which is still problematic. Right? So this does not happen. So it means that actually, in this setup, if I start going right, I go right all the time in my first half. And I go right until I arrive at this vertex. And, I, and then my second half starts there. And so my repetitively colored lazy walk is actually a path, and you actually get a repetition. OK? So let me quickly do the the case where they, they decide to synchronize in the other direction. So if here, uh, when I start, I go right, and here it synchronizes with going left, then all the moves, they will be opposite. So when I go right here, I go left here, uh, and vice versa. Okay, but the argument that we just did, that if we have a closed walk in my first half, I can, uh, then this maps to closed walk in my second half, the fact that we mirror the, pr the operations does not change anything. So we could just remove this closed walk and have a shorter problematic lazy walk. So this argument is still true. So this does not happen. So it means that in the first half, I go right all the time, right? Et cetera. And in my second half, I go left all the time. Now let's see what's happening in terms of my color sequence. At the beginning, I go right. So I don't know, I have A, B, C, D. And now let's look, let's look at what happens in my, in my second half. Let's throw it a bit further away. I start from here, K plus one. Right here, B, C, 
see, and then this will collide at some point. Maybe I have D here, and it depends on how it collides. It will depend on the parity of K. So if K is even, so if this thing here is even, this will collide in a single color. Right, so in this case, um, this is odd, and this defines a palindrome. So why do you get a palindrome when k is even? Because then k plus 1 is odd, and then you have same color here and here, same color here and here, same color here and here, here and here, and then you end up with the same color in the middle. That's a palindrome. But that contradicts the fact that you have a palindrome. Okay, and now if k is odd, um, you get a contradiction with the repetition. In that case, you actually get twice the same color next to each other. Right? Same, 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 then same next to each other, and that's a repetition of size 2. But if it's the same vertex, then k is even. Uh, so, uh, in other words, you do this. And then you end up either on the same vertex, and that's a palindrome, or to, to two adjacent ones, and that's a, a small repetition. OK? You're happy with that proof? OK, so now we are done with this. Uh, just the last case where you do this, but then yes. Yes. you didn't see. Yes, I, I didn't mention it, but yes. This really covers the, the, all the cases. Thanks. OK, now we are done to proving this lemma C with the seven minutes that are left. And I wanted to prove this lemma, but I'm not going to prove it with four colors. So there is an existing proof with four colors. Um, I'm not going to do it because it's not short. What I'm going to give you is a quick proof, a very short proof with six colors. And it, I love this proof. This is, a, in my opinion, a very, very clever argument which is due to Mathieu Rosenfeld from uh, yeah, one year and a half ago. And before that, there were different ways of proving this lemma using probabilistic techniques, using the local lemma, or a technique called entropy compression, or whatever. Uh, but uh, Mathieu Rosenfeld came up with a very short and clever argument that I can tell you in five minutes. So let's do it. OK, so we want to show that well, we are going to do it with six colors. So we want to show that the path has a vertex coloring, which is non-repetitive and palindrome-free. And his idea is, well, let's show something much stronger. Let's show that the, the number of good colorings, and by good coloring, I mean a coloring which is non-repetitive and palindrome-free, it, it will grow exponentially. More precisely, if you let Cn be the number of good colorings with six colors, of your n vertex path, then we claim that Cn plus 1 is at least twice Cn. And this is enough for our purpose because you know C1 is at least 1. It's actually 6, <laughs> but uh, it's at least 1. And so we do get that uh, Cn is non-zero for every n. And actually, it grows really fast. Right? So that's the, the key idea of the proof, is you know, to show something much stronger to have the induction go through. We do a proof by induction. Now, let me call an extension the following thing. I want to color my path on n plus 1 vertices. And to do that, I first take a good coloring my, of my first n vertices. Right, so I look at the first n vertices. I take a good coloring, a coloring that works there. And then I color arbitrarily the last vertex. Right, so I have six options for the last vertex. And I will call that an extension. Right, so it's an extension of a good coloring. The extension is not guaranteed to be good, but that's what I would call an extension. So among all the extensions, some of them will be bad and some of them will be good. Let B be the number of bad extensions. What we care about is Cn plus 1, the number of good colorings of our path on n plus 1 vertices. Well, the number of good colorings, this is the number of all extensions minus the bad ones. How many extensions do we have? Well, you start with a good coloring of your n first n vertices. 
And then for the last vertex, you have six, six options to color the last vertex. Okay, so you have six times CN uh, extensions, and some of them are bad, so you remove them. And now you're left with uh, the good ones, and that's your CN plus one. Okay, so far nothing special, right? Um, now let's you know look a bit about let's look a bit at bad extensions, and that this is the end of the proof at the end of this slide. So why is an extension bad? Well, it, an extension could be bad because when you color the last vertex, you create some repetition. If you create a repetition of length 2i, I'm going to count such bad extension in ri. Or an extension could be bad because you create a palindrome when you color the last vertex. If you create a palindrome of length 2i plus 1, I'm going to count such bad extensions in pi. Right, so these are i and pi, they count uh, bad extensions of a certain type. Now if you look at the number of bad extensions, this is at most the sum of these numbers. Why isn't it an equality? Because, you know, maybe an extension is bad for multiple reasons. But definitely when you sum up these numbers, you have at least the number of bad extensions. And now the key observation is the following, it's these two inequalities here. Let's start with this one here on the left. So it's an upper bound on the number of bad extensions that, have, that are bad because they contain a repetition of length to i. So if you have a bad extension that contains a repetition of length to i, it's a bad extension, so you're coloring the vertices from 1 up to n plus 1. And if it's counted by ri, it means that you have a repetition of length 2i. But then this repetition, that it definitely needs to include the last vertex, because it was good before. Right? So you have this repetition that looks like this. And what you can do is, you know, kill that second part. Just look at this part. This is a good coloring. This is a good coloring, which is uh, of length n plus 1 minus i, because you deleted i vertices. OK? And so every bad extension of this type can be mapped injectively to a good coloring of n plus 1 minus i vertices. And why is it injective? Because, you know, once you see the last i vertices here, you know that to get back to your back, uh, bad extension, you just have to repeat it. Okay? Same with palindromes, because if you look at pi, and you have i here, then you have i plus 1 here, special vertex there, and you also have the same injective mapping because, well, if you see the last i plus 1 vertices there, you know how to complete the last i vertices because you know it's a palindrome. Right, so you have these two inequalities which, are, uh, which come from this observation. And now, everything else is just manipulating the inequalities that we established. So we are going to use the induction hypothesis. Induction hy hypothesis tells us that, you know, Cn is at least twice cn minus 1, etc. So it's at least um, 2 to the i minus 1 times cn plus 1 minus i, right, for, for i at least 1. Right, so when i is 1, this is 0, and this is cn. This is vacuous, but this, this is correct. So, if I put the 2 to the i minus 1 on the other side, you get this inequality here by induction. Okay, now I combine everything. The number of bad extensions at most, the number of bad extensions sorted by types. Every ri I bound by this. Every pi I bound by this. It's the same bound, so I group them together. And I have at most twice the sum of this c n plus 1 minus i, where i is at least 1. Okay, 
Now I use the proof that bound by induction. This is at most twice the sum for i at least one of cn times this uh, two to the minus in parentheses i minus one. And well, you know, put cn in front. This is two, so you get four cn. Okay, so the number of bad extensions is at most four cn. Cn plus one, the number of good uh, good colorings of the path on n plus one vertices, this is six cn minus minus the number of bad extensions. So it's six cn is at least six cn minus four cn, and we are left with two cn. Right. So you see that proving this much stronger property, the fact that cn plus one is at least two cn. This helps the induction go through, and everything else uh, go through. Anyway, so I, I like this proof very much. So thank you for your attention. I, I went over time a bit, but if there is a quick question, I'm happy to answer it. So uh, is there some now open conjecture for some class of graphs we would like to have found that Number. Yes, there is, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Okay. Yes, but there are definitely uh, still open problems for non-repetitive connected numbers.